All right, so in this lecture, we're going to study DC to DC converters. In, the le in lecture two, we looked at transformers going from a DC AC level to another DC level. In this lecture, we are going to go from DC to DC. In, in the last lecture, we actually went from D AC to DC using rectifiers, but that has some limitations. The first lim limitation in lecture two is that we cannot work with AC in, in most cases, in a cell phone, for example, everything works in DC. In most mechatronics projects, you're going to, to develop things work in DC as well. So converting DC levels through a rectification from a transformer is not an option, is not efficient. We would need a transformer that can change a turn ratio and then rectify that voltage to create a DC voltage. So the only way to change the voltage level with what we have so far would be to change the turn ratio of a transformer. And as you can imagine, that is uh, quite inefficient. We cannot use transformers to convert DC levels from one level to another because it only works in AC. We need a changing magnetic field to create uh, an induction in a transformer. So now we need to look at an alternative to go from DC to DC. And this has many applications. As I said, in a cell phone, you have one battery, but you have different elements that operate at a different voltages. How do we now go from a DC input to a different level of a DC input without passing through AC? If you think about a DC motor control, when you control a DC motor in a mechatronic project, if you want to control the speed of that motor, we are essentially doing voltage regulation. And if you power that from a battery, how again, do we change the level of the output in our circuit to change the speed of the motor? So that's what this is what we're going to see today in this lecture, DC to DC converters. This is, this is very useful. And this is the foundation from inverters, which will be in the next lecture. We're going to go from DC back to AC. So today we're going to understand the principles of DC converters. We are going to analyze two types, a step up and a step down analyze and design DC to DC converters and uh, model them analytically. I already mentioned the applications uh, here is one from control systems. If you have this motor and you want to control the speed, we need to control the voltage. How do you take a DC input and make that variable to control the voltage? And this is the other application I mentioned. If you have a cell phone, <laughs> how do we make different uh, elements that a cell phone operate at different voltages? So here is the principle of operation. A DC to DC circuit converts a DC current into another level of DC. So it converts the voltage applied to the load at different levels. The ideal output of our DC to DC converter would be a perfectly DC direct current, perfect direct current voltage like that. That's the ideal scenario. But in reality, because of the very nature of this DC converters, you're going to see how they work, we cannot get a perfect DC output. You'll get some modulations around it. These modulations will come from harmonics uh, of the in from the opening and closing of gates in the circuit. Here is the idea of our DC to DC converter. It's very simple and not very elegant. We have a DC input right there, a voltage source. And let's assume that our load here is a resistor R. <clears throat> the idea is very simple. We have a, we put a gate here that it can be implemented using a MOSFET or a transistor. And we are simply opening and closing this switch to deliver voltage or not to the output. And depending on the timing of that switching, we can now change the average voltage applied to the output. Of course, this is a purely resistive load. So if the switch is closed, we have current. If the switch is not closed, there is no current. Hence, this capacitor here that it can hold acts as a filter and can hold the output voltage at a given level. So it doesn't bounce from zero to Vs. It, goes, it maintains a average voltage. Okay. If we um, close the circuit, then close the switch, 
the voltage across the load is Vs. If we open the switch, the voltage across the load is simply zero. Yeah. And again, we implement this with a MOSFET or some sort of transistor. So let's look at this in more detail. Let's consider that we have a resistive load. We are going to, to study more complex cases later. And this complex load, uh, this resistive load R is connected to that power input Vs, power source Vs. We are going to open and close this switch at a frequency F, which gives a period of one over, which is one over the period. So the period is one over F. And that is typically in the order of uh, kilohertz, something very fast is happening very fast. Within one period, we are going to maintain the switch open and closed for a specific amount of time. So let's assume in this case here that the switch opens at time T1. So from zero to T1, the switch is closed. And from T1, now uh, for a period of T2, the switch is open. And after that, you're going to repeat the cycle. So our period stops here. Our period is time one plus time two. During time one, switch is closed, current flows through the circuit. During the period T1 to T2, the circuit is open. There is no current flowing through it. And that's what we see in the second graph here. In the second graph, we see the current flowing through the load. If the switch is closed, we have uh, V over R flowing through the load as a current. And when the switch is open for, the, for, period, for that period of time, T2, then the circuit is, uh, the circuit doesn't conduct, there is no current. This ratio of how long we keep the switch closed, we are going to call that the duty cycle. You're going to call that K, that it will be T1 over T, capital T. T1 is the amount of time the switch is closed, capital T is T1 plus T2 is the period of our cycle, one over the frequency. If we keep the switch clo open all the time, closed all the time, then T1 equals to capital T, and this would be one which means that we have a 100% duty cycle. The switch is always closed. This current is always delivered to the load. If T1 is zero, the circuit is always open. So that would be 0%. There is no never current flowing through the load. Okay, and this is again called the duty cycle, which now varies from zero to one. If this is our system, now we can take the average voltage across the, the, the load. The average voltage is simply the integral of one over T, the period from zero to T1. Right? That's the only portion that it has a current flowing from T1 to T2, that would be zero. Integral of this current, the, the voltage, sorry, the voltage DS, DT. The voltage should follow the same curve as the, the current So our voltage is Vs during that period and is zero else, uh, otherwise. So if you take this integration, now we, this becomes T1 over capital T. And this is what we defined as the duty cycle K. So our output average voltage is K times Vs. If you have a 50% duty cycle, the average voltage in the output is half of the input voltage. Okay. If we have a 100% duty cycle, then the K is one, the voltage across the load, the average voltage across the load equals the DC input. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Now let's do the let's do the RMS voltage. So they have the same idea here, but now we are taking the root mean square voltage across the load. It's the same idea in the beginning, but now we see here that we have a squared 
the voltage, so it's Vr squared, and you have the square root. So if you follow this simple uh, manipulation here, we'll see that the result of this is the square root of k times Vs. That's the RMS, root mean square voltage across the load. So this is the fundamental principle of operation of step down converters. Why step down? Because the input can only go from Vs, the power, the source voltage, to zero or zero to Vs. It's only comprised within that range. So now we have an effective way to step a voltage down, a DC voltage into a average voltage down. Remember that this is happening very fast. This is, this is happening in the order of kilo, uh, kilohertz. Right, so a fraction of a second or milliseconds is the period where this switch is opening or closing. Another advantage of this is that this switch can be operated at very, very low power with a microcontroller, for example. Right? The power is delivered not from the microcontroller, but through the power source. Question so far? Anything of note? No. Nope. All right, so let's assume that this converter has no losses. If that is the case, we can calculate the input and the output power will be the same. The input power is simply one over T integral from zero to KT, which is T1 again, times vo load voltage and load current. And nothing new here. And if we continue this calculation, it's very simple we'll see that uh, for I here, we simply replace that with V over R for a resistive load that gives V zero squared over R. Solving for the integration gives us this. Now, what I want to note here is that the power delivered to the load is linearly dependent on the duty cycle K. That makes perfect sense. The higher K, the more time the switch is closed, the longer the switch is closed and the more power is delivered to the output. The effective input resistance seen by the source can also be calculated. If we consider that uh, the resistance here is simply Vs divided by the current and the current itself is K times Vs over R, the average current, uh, this simplifies to R over K. So what do we see here? We see that the duty cycle also affects the impedance seen by the source. The same way we did for transformers. Here, the idea is easier. The equivalent resistance seen by the source depends inversely on the duty cycle K. Okay. So in conclusion, the duty cycle goes from zero to one, the output voltage from zero to Vs in that same process, and the output power, the effective resistance, they both determine the, uh, they're both determined by the duty cycle. Okay. Any questions? Does anybody have questions? All good? Okay, so in a microcontroller, now the question will be, how do we determine the duty cycle itself. How do you determine this signal that will be sent to that transistor that will open and close the switch? The idea is again simple. We have this reference signal in blue and you're going to create this triangular waveform with a period of T. This period of T will determine the period at which the transistor operates. And this will have a magnitude of VCR and you have this reference signal VR. This can easily be implemented electronically. Now what we're gonna do is compare these two signals. If our reference signal VR is greater than the triangular waveform, then our duty cycle signal is one, is active. Whenever now the our reference voltage is lower than the triangular waveform, then we set that to zero. We see that if we move VR up, what happens to the duty cycle? Does it increase or decrease 
If you move the reference voltage up, what happens to the duty cycle? It would decrease. It would decrease. Uh, would KT increase or decrease K times T? K times T would shift. Oh, yes. Right, right. It would shift to the right. So the duty cycle, which, which depends on this distance here, increases, increases. All right, so when VR equals to zero, the duty cycle is zero. And when VR equals to VRC, the, mag the maximum value there, then the duty cycle is one. All right. And we call this ratio the modulation index VR over VCR, their magnitudes. All right. So the higher VR, the greater the duty cycle. And this is again, how it is implemented in a microcontroller. So this is the signal now that we give to the MOSFET. And if you want to change the voltage output to average, just move VCR up and down. And this, uh, this system here will automatically determine the duty cycle to be applied to the transistor. All right, so now let's consider uh, this scenario here is a bit more complicated because now we have an inductive load, a resistive load and a voltage source. This again, represents a DC motor. All the elements we need in a DC motor are here. We have the same operating modes from T1, from zero to T1, the switch is closed. So if the switch is closed, current flows like that, cannot flow through the diode, right? The diode is reversed biased. Current will flow through the inductor like that. And our equivalent circuit is right here. When now we open the switch, the current that it was loaded in the inductor is trapped there and will flow this way. The inductor actually reverses polarity and then pushes current through the diode like that. And then for the second part of our period, this is the equivalent circuit, right? I think there is a mistake here. This should have been from T1 to T, not T2. Uh, may I ask a, a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, someone was just asking something in the comments. I just want to make sure it wasn't wrong. Uh, the, so duty cycle is uh, the ratio, like how much percent of time the switch is on compared to the full period, the time between okay. peaks, right? Precisely, yeah. Okay, so that, all right, That's thanks. what we defined here. So this is T1 and this is T. So the duty cycle is defined as T1 over T. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, perfect. Just wanna make sure I didn't say something wrong, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of information in this lecture. Okay, so this is now the same principle, but the difference is that now current when trapped in that secondary part of the circuit flows through the diode and has a path to uh, dissipate energy through the resistor. Okay, so let's analyze this circuit now. Let's analyze this first part here to start. When, when the switch is closed, we have this equivalent circuit and we can now do Kirchhoff's law in the circuit. Here we have the equation for that. I think there is no need to go over this. Now we, we all know how we, this equation is taken. And let's assume that when we do that, there is an initial current in the uh, inductor. And that initial current, we are going to call that I1. When you close the switch, there is an initial current in the inductor and the inductor is loaded with current I1. We can now take the Laplace transform of this circuit and remember that here, because we have the initial current, we have LSI of S minus LI0, which is our I1, the initial current. And when you take the inverse Laplace of that subjected to that specific initial condition, this is what you have as the temporal response of the current through that circuit. You recognize this, you see that this is the natural term that comes from the initial current. And you recognize this structure as well from control systems that comes from the natural response of this part of the equation here. The only difference is Vs minus E here, 
E is the voltage right there, right? So I think this, this, there's really nothing new here. So now that we have the temporal response, let's let, give some time for the current to develop in the circuit. And you're going to give that a T1 seconds. The switch will remain closed for T1 seconds. And then the current that is started at I1 will go up and reach a value of I2. I2, we could stop anywhere like here, for example. Right? But I2 will now be the current after T1 seconds. The current in the, in, the, in the circuit after T1 seconds. What happens at T1? We now open the circuit. Now open the circuit at T1. And now we are in the second part of the circuit. Now the current will flow through the diode. The inductor saw a sudden change in the current flowing through it. So it reverses polarity. Now we have the inductor charged like that, pushing current down to maintain the same level of current. It doesn't like current fluctuations. And you now the current will now flow through the diode in that resistor there. Now let's restart time to zero. The time now is to, for these equations, as far as the equations are concerned, is again back to zero. And you can do another Kirchhoff slot here. Same as before, but you notice that now we have zero. Right? There is no voltage input anymore. This L di, di2 dt is subjected to the same initial condition that it had before, but now our initial condition is I2. What is I2? I2 is the final value reached by the current here at T1 not necessarily the steady state value. The steady state value here would be what? Would be Vs minus E over R, right? This is the steady state value. If you give sufficient time for the system to reach that steady state value, that would be I2, the initial condition in the next iteration. But we can stop anywhere, say like we could stop here, right? So I2 is the initial condition when you got at T1 in the previous iteration. So again, keeping in mind that the inductor has that initial condition, we can take the inverse Laplace of this equation. And this is the result. Very similar to what we had before, but we see here that we don't have Vs anymore. Vs is now zero. So it's the same equation, Vs is zero. The initial condition has changed to I2. So now we are here, this part of the circuit only operates during this time T2. And now the current will start to decay and the, uh, the power is dissipated in the resistor. At time T2, or uh, sorry, after T2, we reached one period T. And now we are going to close the switch again. We're going to close the switch again. What is this at time at period T? What is that of current that it reaches now? It goes down to a current I1. What is I1? I1 is the initial current that we used in this first iteration. The final voltage, the final current from this iteration is the initial current in this one, the Final current in this one is the initial voltage in that one. Initial current, so initial current in that one, initial condition for that, right? And now we have this steady state operation where that you can see here, we fluctuate between current I1 and current I2. Our current rises between zero and T1 and current decays back to I1 between T1 and T2. Is this clear? Is this clear? Any any questions? Uh, up quick question. Point. Yep. Uh, some people in the chat are asking what E is. E, this E here? Yeah. Is that voltage right there? And that represents just the feedback voltage from the motor or something? The back EMF in a motor. Yeah. Okay. Or any voltage source, if you like, any voltage source. Okay. Right, just to keep this method, this model generic. 
Okay, any other question? Is it clear that the the system starts at I1, which is the, the final current here, goes to I2, which now gives the initial current in this mode, and then from I2, it goes back to I1. All right, this must be very clear. Question? Yeah. So is I2, it's the, it's the current at T1 before the switch is uh, opened again? I2 is the final volt current that we reach just before we open the switch again. During this amount of time here, the switch is closed. And during this amount of time here, the switch is open. So when you close the switch, there is an initial current I1. Then the current rises to I2, and then we open the switch. Now the initial current in this part of the circuit is I2 and will decay again. And when we, we now close the switch again, we are at current I1 and the cycle repeats. Is that, is that, does that help? Yeah, thank you. All right, so now we can find what these currents are. How do we find current I1, for example? Or let's say current I2. Well, current I2, we can go back here and simply replace time with T1 in that equation and here. And how do we find I2? We can simply replace time here and here with T minus T1. T minus T1, which is uh, T2, basically. This is T2. And now we have this current. Now, another way to see that is T1 is basically KT. And T2 is 1 minus K times T. Right, this is kt, this is t. So now replacing these values into the, temp the temporal response, we find the initial conditions i1 and i2. We can now replace these two equations one in another. We have two variables, two equations. We can solve for i1 and i2. And here we have their values. Right, it's just simple math now. I'm going to skip those steps. So this is the initial current and the final current and the current now fluctuates between these two values. What we call now the ripple current or the peak to peak current, this difference here, delta I is simply I2 minus I1. That's the ripple current that ideally would be zero. Ideally would just be a constant DC. Right, but there is a ripple current that we need to minimize there. And that's how we calculate it. Any more questions? No. Okay. But I'm going to ask this question again. Do you understand where I1 and I2 come from and how they are calculated? that we can simply for I2 replace time with KT and for I1 simply replace time with one minus K times T. This is T2, All right? This dif distance here is T2. Let's call this T to avoid confusion. That distance is T2. Is, is this clear? Any questions here? Uh, I have a small question. Yep. Sure. Um, just the K uh, variable, uh, that's the duty cycle, right? Yes, K is the duty cycle okay. from zero to one, right? Zero. So if K is say 0 0.5, then T1 is zero is, and the T2 are exactly the same. Okay, T1 okay. T2 are exactly the same. Okay, thank if, you. If we're missing both I1 and I2 in this case, we need to use both equations to solve both of them at the same time. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. You have to. You know, it's a simple linear system. 
we can take I1 here, replace it there. Then the equation is only a function of I2. Right. And so okay. for I2. And then in the same way, you take I2 and replace it there, you find an equation for I1. Right. And those are given here. So I'm going to skip that because it's, uh, it's a little long. Right. But that's the process to find them. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so when would you have your I1 initially being not zero? Because technically when you start your circuit, right? Like once you yeah. uh, close it, then your I1 starts off at zero, right? But where would you have yes. a case where it's like not zero? No, it will always start at zero. So okay. this, what we see here is the steady state operation. But the actual circuit would probably look like this until it settles. And then it reaches a steady state like that. Okay, that makes sense. Right. So we are only sorry. We are only focusing on steady state operation here. But you are right. It doesn't start uh, at I one. It always starts at zero when you turn the circuit on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So now the recover step down converters. Let's go and look at step up converters. Now the idea is to increase the voltage at the load instead of decreasing it. Here is the arrangement you're going to use with that. You will see it's quite clever. We have a load right there. And we have a capacitor in parallel with that load just to hold an average voltage. We have the diode that is conducting current in this, this way only. And the inductor, a voltage source, and the switch is now here. So let's see what happens. In this system, we have the same idea of duty cycle, opening and closing that gate at a specific time. If the gate's closed, then the cur then current will flow through the path of minimum resistance through this loop here and will load the inductor. When we open the switch, now the inductor will have a, car a voltage VL. When you open the switch, the current that was charging the inductor fast now decreases. The inductor sees a change in current. It doesn't like to changes in the current. It will reverse polarity of the, the in the in the voltage to continue to push to push current through. The current cannot suddenly drop. So when you open the switch, the inductor will use its magnetic field to create more current to keep the current constant until, of course, it decays. It then reverses it's voltage, it reverses polarity because now the magnetic field is decreasing. So d phi dt is negative. The voltage across the inductor changes, which means that now current has only one path to take and that is through the load and back to the source. So the energy that was stored in the inductor is now delivered to the load. The effective voltage that the load sees pushing current through is now Vs plus VL plus the voltage across the inductor that was loaded in the first cycle. All right. So again, when you close the switch, the inductor charges. When you open the switch, the inductor sees a drop in the current, but the current cannot drop immediately in an inductor. So we reverse polarity because now d phi dt is phi being the magnetic flux is uh, negative or di dt is, is negative, is the current is decreasing. The current reverse, the voltage reverses. And now we have Vs and the inductor both delivering uh, energy to the load. Uh, and this is the principle of operation. And then we close the switch again and we load the inductor one more time. And then we repeat this process uh, uh, in a cycle to create, deliver current to the load. So here is the principle of operation. Switch is closed from zero to T1. The inductor loads. Switch is open at time T1 for a, for a time T2. And again, our duty cycle K is T1 over capital T. When the switch is closed, the voltage across the inductor will rise is simply dl di dt, which we can approximate here with l d, uh, delta i delta uh, divided by t1. So delta i is 
this distance here, the initial current divided by minus the, the final current minus the initial current, which will now be given here linearly as an approximation as Vs divided by L times T1. So the more time we give, the more uh, current is loading in the inductor, as you can see in this first mode of operation there. Right? Close the switch, current linearly increases. It's not linear in practice, but uh, in, uh, for simplification, that's what I'm going to assume here. And now let's uh, open the switch. When you open the switch, now you're dealing with this path. So let's neglect that in that capacitor for now. Just forget about that one. We have now a voltage across the load that is Vs plus the voltage across the inductor, plus the voltage across the inductor. All right, that's what we calculated in the previous step. Delta I is taken from the previous step here. We can simply replace it in there and do some very simple algebraic manipulation here to find this expression right there, just replacing delta i into equation 10. We can now uh, further expand this equation, just find a common denominator, here it is. We know that a t1 plus t2 is the period of t. And you can also write that a t2 is t minus t1. Now divide everything by T, capital T, we get one over one minus T1 over T. And this is the duty cycle K. So here is the average voltage across the load. You can follow these steps later, it's very simple manipulation here. Now there's something interesting. If the duty cycle is zero, the voltage across the load is exactly the voltage input. As K decreases, now the average voltage in the output increases. And we'll follow the curve that we see here. Now the duty cycle, as the duty cycle increases, the voltage across the load increases. Right. And at one here, it would tend to infinity, but that is not a continuous operation mode. So K needs to be smaller than one. And this is the principle of step up converters. Any questions? Any questions here? No? Uh, can you just repeat the last part uh, about the as the K, as the duty cycle, I think you said increases. Yeah, so as the duty cycle increases, all right, we see that the, the equation 12 now also increases, the voltage across the load increases. As the duty cycle increases, so does the voltage across the load. Okay, okay, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. yeah. I think I maybe I said decrease, but you can see from the graph there, Right, the voltage, the duty cycle decreases, the denominator now becomes smaller and smaller, tending to zero. So the overall overall equation 12 goes up. Yeah. But you can never operate at one. If you operate at one, this means that this is always closed. The, the switch is always closed and current only flows here. Right. So one uh, doesn't, doesn't work. All right, so now let's do the same analysis we did before for a step up converter. Same circuit, but now with this different arrangement where the switch is here, the inductor is there, and we have the same load. So let's just start with the first operating mode. Now you're just loading the inductor. When you load the inductor, the switch is closed. This is what we are left with. V input equals to LDI dt. Now subjected again to a initial current I0 at of I1. We take the inverse Laplace transform for the current. So for the current, this is what we get. A very simple approach 
this is now the temporal response for the current. So the current starts at I1 and goes at time T1 linearly. And there's an assumption once again, linearly goes to I2. Right. And T1 is the time when we are now going to open the switch. This is the time we gave we gave to the inductor to load, to create the store that energy that it will now go and that is now going to be delivered to the load. Once again, T1 is K times T, the duty cycle times the period. Okay. What is the final current now? Final current I2 is simply current I1. Is simply current I1 when T equals to, to what? What is the final current? Is I1 when time is? T1. T1, exactly. When time is T1 or KT. All right, that's uh, current I2. And that's now the initial condition in the next iteration that you're going to see here. Now we open the switch, current flows like that. And the initial current in the inductor is I1, right, the final current in the previous uh, iteration. Sorry, I2, this is I2, the final current in the previous iteration. So we are back to a circuit that we, we've seen before. Here we have Kirchhoff's law. Again, the inductor is subjected to initial current I2. Do the inverse Laplace of this. This is now the temporal response for current I2. The natural term here, the solution, the initial current, and the fourth term of the solution right there. Okay, now we have the temporal response for the second mode of operation. What is the final current right now? Once we open the switch, we close the switch one more time. Now the switch is open. At which time are we going to open the switch? We're going to wait T2 seconds. We're going to wait T2 seconds, which is T minus T1 or one minus k times t. So if I replace any of this in time there, we get the final current when the circuit reaches uh, that time t2. What is this final current? This final current is the initial current we used in this step. The final current in this step is the initial current in this step. The final current at time T1 equals to the initial current in the second part of the circuit. So to calculate that, nothing easier than simply replacing T time with T2 or one minus K the duty cycle. And here we have the final current reached by the step up converter. You see here, the, it's the same we did before, but now here we have one minus K, one minus the duty cycle. Here are the two equations. We can again replace one into another and solve for I1 and I2. This is what we get. This Z constant is just a constant that it depends on all the parameters here, just to make it easier to write. And now if we do I1, I2 minus I1 to find the ripple current, we can combine these two equations, find the ripple current. This will be the result after some manipulation. Vs times K times T divided by L. Let's see if that makes sense. The higher the input voltage, the higher the ripple current. That makes sense. Uh, the more energy we deliver, the higher the amplitude, the difference between I1 and I2. Remember again that delta I is I2 minus 
I want. The higher the duty cycle, the higher the ripple current. Does that one make sense? The higher the duty cycle, the higher the ripple current. It also makes sense in the sense that uh, we are creating, we are giving more time for the system to reach a higher current. And divided by L, the, the higher the inductance, the lower the ripple current. So the, and that makes perfect sense because the inductor opposes changes in the current. So the higher the inductance, the lower the ripple current. So a very large inductor is likely to keep that a delta I very small. And, you, the high, and you, we may tend to a, a perfect DC voltage in the output. Right, so this is the operation of the step up converter. Once again, uh, we have one period right here. And now our voltage in the output can go from zero to Vs one minus divided by one minus K. Right, the voltage now increases in the output. I've posted two or three different codes that I encourage you to use to analyze how this works better. If you, there is a MATLAB code that where all these equations are implemented and you can verify with that MATLAB script, the influence of all these parameters in the ripple current. It's posted in module five. And there is one LT in one uh, Simscape file with the DC step up and step down converters that you can also use for um, to, to study uh, in more detail. Any any questions before we conclude this and do some exercises? There's a lot of information in this lecture. Any any questions? No. Okay. Now let's uh, move on to measures of performance. We designed the step up and step down converter. And ideally, as I said, the output would be a perfect sinus, a perfect DC output, but that is not the case. It will have some oscillations. And these oscillations are supposed to, uh, to be minimized with a proper design. So now we have to compare how effective our circuit is in converting DC to DC. So the input power is simply the input, the average input voltage and the average input current. That's DC, the average is sufficient. The output power now, instead of looking at the average, we are going to look at the RMS power, root mean square voltage and current. It doesn't make sense to talk about average AC. So now the converter efficiency, this is not the power efficiency, this is the converter efficiency, how efficient it is into converting DC to DC, is simply the DC power divided by the AC power. Uh, this for now assumes that there is no losses. Uh, this is not the power transfer efficiency, this is the converter's efficiency. Question? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, weren't we using DC to DC? Why are we uh, using AC in this efficiency calculation? Very good, because the output is not perfectly a DC. The output will actually look like that. Uh, so if you want to, to analyze this in terms of a DC current, the RMS is the closest. Uh, it, this could go, let's say we have something going around zero like that. The average would be very close to zero, but the RMS voltage is not zero. You're still delivering power to the output. If you go, if you go back here, look at the current curve. Right? It's, it doesn't really resemble anything like a DC. It would if delta I is zero. And then you have a perfect DC output like that. Right? Then we would simply use DC, DC and DC, but the output is not perfectly DC, so we need to consider the RMS. Makes okay. sense. Now the ripple content, another measure of performance of the voltage is given here. VR is the ripple current, is the, um, RM, the RMS squared minus the uh, average squared. And with this, we can, we can calculate what we call the ripple factor, is the ripple 
content of the output voltage divided by the average voltage. Uh, it gives us a percentage of how much fluctuation there is. And you can do the same for the current. The ripple current is the RMS current squared minus the average current squared, square root. And then we divide that by the input uh, average voltage. And it gives again, a, a, it gives us a percentage of how much fluctuation we will see in the output voltage. Uh, these are some measures of performance. We're going to use them to quantify how well our converters work. So RF, again, the ripple factor is a percentage of fluctuation in the output voltage or output current based on the magnitude of the input. All right, are there any questions before we do some exercises? We can use these equations. Any, any questions? No? So let's do one exercise. I think this will make things a lot easier. This, this lecture is a bit complicated. There's a lot of information here. And the next lecture is a little worse in terms of the amount of information in the lecture. So I recommend that you review this before we go into the next lecture because you're going to use the same principles here to go now from AC, DC back to AC. You need to also find a way to invert the magnitude of the current, the current and voltage. Let's do this example. The converter uses a MOSFET transistor as a switch. When the switch is on, the voltage drops by two volts. The voltage across this MOSFET here is two volts. Uh, it's not a perfect switch. The chopping frequency or the, the frequency at which we operate this switch is one kilohertz and the duty cycle is 50%. Determine the average output voltage, the RMS output voltage, converter efficiency, efficiency, effective input resistance, and the ripple factor of the output voltage. We have a chopping frequency, chopping frequency of one kilohertz. This gives us the period as one over F, and this is one millisecond. The duty cycle is 50%, so K equals to 0 0.5. We have a voltage drop of two volts, a load of 100 volts, an input voltage of 200, and we want the average output voltage, RMS, converter efficiency, the effective input resistance, the ripple factor of the output voltage. Let's do this one. Is this a DC, uh, a step up or a step down converter? Is this a step up or a step down? Down. It's a step down. Right? A step down. We can go from the output voltage across the load can either be 200 or zero. Right? It can only be comprised between those limits. So we have here a frequency of 0 0.1 hertz and we have a duty cycle of 0 0.5. One kilohertz. Sorry, kilohertz. So let's do A, the average output voltage. What is the average output voltage? The average output voltage is simply, average is K times V, because it's a step down converter. But now we need to account for this two volts drop here. So the voltage across the load is either 200 minus two or zero. It's not 200 because there's a two volt drop right there. So our V is actually 200, 200 minus two. And this is times the, the uh, duty cycle 0 0.5. So the average voltage across the load is 99 volts. Uh, it's not 100 volts because again there is this voltage drop here and the voltage across the load by voltage across the load i mean this voltage only only the voltage across the resistor all right this is our 
load right there. Okay. Now let's do question B, the average voltage, sorry, the RMS voltage across the load. So R is the voltage in RMS is the square root of K times V. So the square root of 0 0.5, K is the duty cycle times the voltage. Again, the effective voltage across the load is either zero or 198 volts because of this two volt drop there. And this is 140 volts. Are we good with this one? Questions? No? If there are no questions, I'll move on. Uh, sorry, I just have one question. Um, yep. Can you just explain the 200 minus two again? Yeah, yeah. so let's let's put a multimeter across the inductor. Okay. Sorry, across the resistor, put a multimeter here. What a voltage would we be reading? When you turn the switch on, there's a 200, there's a two volt drop here. So the actual voltage across the inductor, sorry, the actual voltage across the resistor will be 200 minus two will be 198 volts. Oh, okay, okay, the switch yeah. is open, then it's zero, right? So we are not delivering 200 volts. I can do Kirchhoff's law here, Vs equals to two plus V load. So V load equals to Vs minus two. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay now let's go to C. C is the converter efficiency how do you find the converter efficiency they're not looking at the ripple uh, factor or anything is the efficiency in terms of power so to do that let's do the input power the output power and see how uh, similar they are let's start with the uh, output power what is the output power the output power is one over t integral from zero to when to k1 uh t1 so k times period right this is the entire period but we are only delivering current and power to the output from zero to t1 so from zero to k times t the other second part is zero times v load times the current dt All right the current we can write that as VL over R. So this rewrites as one over T integral from zero to KT of VL squared over R DT. And when you solve this integral, we get KT comes down. So that becomes K times VL squared. What is VL squared is again 200 minus 2 squared divided by R, that's 10. This gives 1960.2 watts. Okay, this is a simple power, average power equation here. The only thing to note is again that the voltage across the load is not 200, it's 200 minus 2. And right? this determines the current. That's the input, the output power delivered to the load. Now let's look at the input power from the power source. What would be the difference? All the difference is that the current is the same, that it goes through the load. But the voltage is not the voltage through the load, is the 200 volts here. That's what comes out of the power source. We only deliver 128. The current here and the current here are exactly the same. The voltages are different. So now our power input is 1 over T integral from 0 to KT, V in. Now the input, the input uh, voltage 200 times I. Thank you. 
this is 1 over t integral from 0 to kt times v in 200. What is the current now? What is the current in this circuit? The current is 200 minus 2 divided by 10. Right, the same that you had here. This is basically the current, the, the voltage is squared. There, there's the voltage drop. If you divide the voltage drop by 10, that gives the current. So the current is Vs minus 2 divided by R. Right, this whole thing here is the current through the load dt. So kt comes down, so k and uh, t and t cancel out. So you have now k times 200 divided by 198 divided by r. And this is 1980 watts. That's the power delivered by the voltage source. What is the converter's efficiency? Is P out, P in. So this, this divided by that. And this is 99% efficiency. Pretty good. 99% efficiency. This would be, a, this is a lot more efficient than a transformer connected to a DC or to a rectifier. It's a 99% conversion rate. Any questions? Any questions here? No? All good? If there are no questions, I'll move on to question D. Sorry, can you can you go over P out again? Just that uh, the V squared over R there. V L right 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 here. Yes. Yeah. All right. So the input volt. Uh, sorry, this is the load voltage. The load voltage is V L times I L. Right. Is the voltage times the current. The current is VL over R, is this voltage divided by the resistance. So you now replace IL up there, we have VL times VL over R. That's VL squared over R. Okay, thanks, that makes sense. And VL, again, VL is only this voltage here, right? So that's 200 minus two. That's what you use for the, the output power. Now the input takes the same current, but the voltage is now delivered from the source is 200. It's taken from the source is 200 volts. Okay, let's do question D, the uh, effective resistance in the output. The effective resistance uh, seen by the input is called that R prime is R over K. So 10 over 0 0.5, and that is 20 ohms. Okay. All right, so I'm going to skip the uh, Skip E because it's a little interest, to be honest. And let's do another exercise if there are no questions related to this one. I'll, I'll post the solution for question D later, but I'm, I'm not going to be asking you to derive this ripple factor. It's more for information. We are not too concerned about that in mechatronics. Is this fine? Should we move on? Well, I just had one quick question. Go ahead. So in this case, is the 200 volts RMS? No, it's DC. It's all DC. We have a resistive load 
right? For for here, so the input is uh, is DC, and all the calculations that we did here are average. Uh, we are not. Uh, oh, I see where the question is coming from. We are not calculating the conversion efficiency. We are calculating the converters efficiency. That's different. The conversion efficiency would be the ripple divided by the average. We would be comparing how close to a DC we have in the output, right? That's the uh, the ripple factor here. That's not what we are calculating. We are calculating the efficiency in power conversion from the input to the output. So it's all uh, average, all average. But isn't it PDC over PAC? Or is that a different situation? Yes, yeah. So it's, uh, the, the, both of this power input and power output are both DC, are both averages, are both averages. Right. We are not calculating the uh, efficiency on how close to a DC the output is. That's a different story. That would be question E, uh, but we're going to skip that. This is the efficiency in power conversion, not in uh, DC to DC conversion, just power itself. Okay, let's do uh, question 16. As I raise the light bar here, you can take a look at it and see how, what we asked there. We have this converter uses a MOSFET as a transistor, a switching frequency of one kilohertz and a 50% duty cycle. The question is, what is the peak to peak load current? What is the average load current and the RMS load current, the root mean square Old current. So the first question here is, is this a step up or is this a step down converter? Uh, step down. This is a step down. Uh, hmm. Isn't this a step down with an RL load? Exactly. It's a step down with an RL load. And that uh, voltage source that we added that for fun. And but now here is set to zero. Question. Yeah. Uh, how do you tell whether it's a step down or step up? Uh, well, you, you have to analyze it. Uh, this one, if you open the switch, there is nothing pushing current through the load. If you close the switch, then the current flows through the load. So it's either current or no current. And there is no, the inductor here doesn't store energy. The inductor is part of the load. Right, the inductor we, to be a DC uh, step up converter, we would need a way to store energy in this inductor and then deliver it to the load. This in this configuration here, all we do is power or not power the the inductor, and when the inductor is not power, is not being charged, is is just pushing current through this part of the circuit. Right, so this is a step down converter with indeed a LRE load. Okay, so let's do this one. The first question is the peak to peak ripple load current. So it's basically delta I. If this is a step down converter, we want to find the delta I, the ripple current. We need to calculate the maximum, the minimum current and the maximum current. So these equations were given in the excerpt in, in the lecture notes. We can simply plug everything in there. We have, what do we have here? We have the input V S is 220. We have the inductance is 0 7.5. Here is the resistance. This V output here is zero, right? So we don't need to worry about that. Uh, what else? The do we have to do 220 minus the voltage drop? Oh, is the voltage drop given? The, the voltage is zero. Yeah. Okay. Voltage is zero. Uh, oh, what yeah, else I, we have? I was saying if the MOSFET had, in the, like in the previous example, if it said the MOSFET had a drop of two volts, for example, would we oh. do 220 minus two? We case? would need to rederive all these equations. Okay. All these equations. 
So you can't just do 220 minus two. You have to come up with. Uh, no, I no, I, I think you can. Yes, yes. Yeah, no, you can. Certainly. Okay. You can do just 200 minus the voltage drop. Yeah, Thank that, you. that works. Okay, and E is, here is zero, right? So then call this E. This E is zero. What is the duty cycle? Is 0 0.5, and you have a frequency of one kilohertz, so T is one over 1,000. And with that, we have everything here. This is just plugging and play. So I, I, I'm going to give you the results directly because that's not our focus here. I1 will be 18.36, and I2 will be 25.63 amps. What is the peak to peak current? That would be I2 minus I1. Can someone calculate this? What is, uh, where is the result there? Okay, As, uh, sorry, say that again. 7.27. 7.27, thank you, amps. So this is the ripple current. What is the average current? The average current is I2 plus I1 divided by two, and this is 22 amps. The average current would be now this average here, I1 is 18, I2 is 25. We are going like that. The ripple current is this difference, the peak-to-peak -peak current, delta I. All right, this is delta I. And the average is simply a number around here the, between these two. So I1 plus A2 divided by 2. Okay, so this is uh, easy. Uh, just plug and play the equations here. Nothing of great interest. But now comes the interesting question. What is the RMS load current? Right, this is the average load current, ripple peak to peak current. What is the RMS? And that's where things get interesting. So let's do question C now, the RMS voltage across the load. We don't need to look at this diagram anymore because now we know where the current starts, where the current ends. And if we assume a linear, uh, change in current, what happens? If you assume a linear change in current, the current should go from I1 to I2, and then back down like that. Right? It goes from 18.36 to 25. 0.63. What is the RMS voltage? Well, the RMS voltage, the RMS current, or the RMS current, is the integral of one over square root of one over t integral of this current dt. All right. Because we have a duty cycle that is symmetric, we can take half of this and to, for in our calculations instead of the whole thing. All right. Because we have 0 0.5. This and that are exactly the same in terms of RMS. So we can use the first half or the second half for calculation. The interesting part is that we need a equation for the current. How do you find an equation for the current here based on that graph? We could take the temporal expression for I1 that we developed before, that it would be fine, but we'll see uh, it can give uh, quite a fair bit of complication in the actual calculation later. If we assume that a, this is a linear process, so current goes from I1 to I2 linearly, we can simply look at our graph and take the equation from there. If you're looking at the RMS current, that's the square root of one over T integral from zero to T, the current i uh, the current dt right that's the definition of the R, uh, current squared dt 
So this would, would mean that we need to take the entire period here. But because we have a symmetric system, we can stop at KT. So we can write instead KT from KT only, right? from zero to T1, I1 squared. Just take this input here, I1, and let's call this I2. Right? Because then this only applies because you have a duty cycle of 50%. So this and that is squared, and then the, the results of that integration would be exactly the same if this is the case. Question. question. Yeah. So if it wasn't exactly half, if k wasn't exactly 0.5, would it be square root 1 over t times the sum of the integral of the left side and the right side? It would be this, yes, yes, plus the integral of, the, this side, which would go from KT to T. Right. KT to T. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So what is this expression here? What is I1? I1 is capital I1 plus a slope times T, which is I2 minus I1 divided by KT times time. This is a linear uh, curve, right? So this is the initial point here. This is the slope of that curve, right? This divided by that times time. So if we input kt here, look at look at this. If we put kt there, we go to the final value of i2 minus i1. I1 and i1 cancel out. This becomes I2, right there. When t is zero, we are at I1. When t is kt, we go to I2, and you go linearly between one point and another. All right, so this is a simply a, a straight line on a 2D plane. Initial point, slope times time. Now we can proceed with our calculation. I0 is integral of one over kt, square root of the integral from 0 to kt of i1, which is here. We can put numerical values there. We have all numerical values, 18.37 plus 7.26 over kt times t. And I'll use i1 here, but this is squared. So 18.37 plus 7.26 over kt, k, capital, capital T here, times t squared dt. Should, uh, do you want me to change, to solve this integral? No? It's a simple integral, right? This is a integrals for kids. Right? Integrals for kids is just a polynomial. All right, so first you need to take the square root, the, the square of this. So it would be the square of this times two times the multiplication of them plus the square of the second term. So this becomes t squared when you take the integral, t to the power of three divided by three. So this is, I think, simple math. So I'm going to skip that derivation, given the time. And I'll just give you the results here. It's going to be 22. 0.1 amps. This is the result of this integration and square root. We know everything here. We first need to find the integral, then replace here the integral, uh, evaluate the integral from zero to kt. Now we have k, we have t, and then it becomes just a numerical expression. Solving for that, it's 21, 22.1 amps. Okay, so if there are no questions, we can do one more example. I'm going to do this one right here. A DC converter can be used in a feedback control system to regulate the speed or torque delivered by a DC motor. The duty cycle is controlled to provide a constant voltage or current, respectively. Draw the schematic diagram for a block scheme of a control structure. The question is basically, if we want now to create 
to use this to control a DC motor, how do you put all these parts together to create a control scheme? So let's do let's do this. So what you want to do basically is to use a DC motor to control a DC motor from a step up or a step down converter. So let's have our plant here. This is the motor we are going to control. Where did I put my marker? This is the motor. We want to control position or speed. And you have a microcontroller that, uh, that provides the duty cycle to the, to the uh, DC converter. The DC converter does uh, delivers the power to the motor. So if this is the motor, and let's say we want to control a generic variable here, I'm going to leave this open for now, either speed or position, we need to give this motor a voltage. This voltage comes from the DC to DC converter. It takes power from an external power supply. And what is the input to the DC to DC converter? What is the input to the DC to DC converter? That's the duty cycle K. By changing the duty cycle K, we change the average voltage and the RMS voltage that is delivered to the motor. Now, if we want to control anything from the motor, we can measure that with a sensor. Take that, create a desired input, create the error, Put the error, let's say, in a PID controller, the output of the PID controller is the duty cycle. A number that it goes from one, zero to one. This is given to the DC to DC converter. And now the voltage is applied to the motor. Question. Yeah. Between the PID and the DC DC, converter there would have to be mm -hmm. like a transfer function or something right just to scale down because the error might not necessarily be zero to one even after the pid right yes yeah okay well yes and no because you could do that by simply tuning down all the parameters okay right but right. your question actually is important in the sense that k needs to be comprised between zero and one if the output here is 50 this is going to be saturated Right. It needs to be comprised between zero and one. So your PID controller must make sure that for the maximum error, you have something close to one and not much higher than that. Or it's basically just saturating the output. Okay, right. thank you. Yeah. Sorry, just to confirm. So you are you are saying that the PID was developed from the start with that in mind? Yes. The no, PID okay. gains, the PID gains must be tuned in the way that we are always within this range. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, there is a limitation here, though. With our duty cycle can only go from zero to one. What happens if you need to reverse the voltage in the output? Right, our voltage in the output can only go from V, this V here. Let's call this V in. It can only go from zero to V in. If you want to reverse the speed of the motor, it doesn't work. That's the inverter. We are going to see that in the next lecture. But for now, for in this arrangement, we are limited. To this from zero to the in but for now that's that's good enough we will complicate that a bit more in the next lecture let's assume that we are want to measure the volt the speed here if you want to control the speed then this is the voltage right we can measure simply the voltage across the terminals of a dc motor like that All right this is the motor and take this voltage compared to desired voltage, and then we'll make the uh, the motor run at a certain speed. Or if you want now to control the speed, simply do the desired here becomes, let's say, the desired speed. We multiply that by the inverse of the speed constant of the motor that it gives a voltage V that we apply, that we compare with this one and then create an error. If you want to do, say, torque control, 
then here we need to measure the current. And how can we measure the current? Typically, it's done with an arrangement like this one. This is the motor. We'll put a resistor here, a very small resistor. We call that a shunt resistance. And we measure the voltage drop across this resistance. The current is simply V over R. Right, that's the sensor part right there. So now we have I coming out here. Right? We actually would have V going in the sensor, V from this. The sensor would be one over R would output I. And then if you want to do torque control, we can define a desired torque. We multiply that desired torque by one over Ki. That's the torque constant. Send that to the controller because the output here is I desired. Right? Torque desired divided by the torque constant gives the current. Now the current enters the desired value here. Compare that with the actual current. Create an error. And then you go through the loop. OK, so this would be a very rough sketch of a control scheme using a DC to DC converter. Again, the limitation that we have here essentially is that our voltage is always positive. It's always the same polarity as V in. We cannot reverse the voltage. So there are, there's a big limitation here. But in order to do that, then this DC to DC converter needs to change to a DC to AC converter, because now we want to go from negative V in to positive V in, anywhere in between. Right? This is the job of a inverter or a DC to AC converter, and this is the subject of lecture six. Okay, I think we are going. We can stop here. Are there any questions? With regards to this arrangement, any conceptual questions? No. This is posted in, uh, in, in on Canvas. I created a simulation in Simulink, showing how this would be used to control the voltage in in the output. Here is not a motor; it's simply a resistive load. So in the simulation I posted, this is a resistive load simply, but the resistive load will change value at some point. It starts, I believe, at 10 ohms, and then halfway through, it becomes 15 ohms. And we want to use this arrangement, the same arrangement, to maintain a voltage, I believe, of 24 volts in the output, or 25. So this is a step down. This is a, with a step up converter, but it uses the same idea. So take a look there. Download that as, as a Simscape model. Download it and use it. Uh, you can use that in your design reports. It's very, very important that you take a look at that. And it, despite the fact that the resistance is changing, our controller here should adjust the duty cycle accordingly to always make sure that the output stays at 24 volts, right? So this is posted on Canvas on module five, download it and uh, use it. You can, it's very useful. You can use that in your design reports. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, so that's all for today. I will see you again next Thursday for a DC to AC converters. Sorry, I have a question, sir. Yeah. Uh, can you explain the torque part again, how you implemented that in the yeah. in the loop? Yeah. So which part? The, is the sensing part fine? Uh, this is for, so that bottom part you're talking about is for the speed or is that the torque over there? This is if this one, the idea here is to measure the current. OK. Right. Remember that a torque. Let's put it this way. What is the um, speed in a DC motor? Is a speed constant? Sorry. Let me let me put this the other way. I I can stay here. What is the voltage in, across a uh, motor? The voltage is a constant times the speed. All right. So if you want to control the speed, you divide the voltage by km to find what voltage you need to apply. Right, roughly to, get sorry, to I, where, where does this km value come from or is that just like a given value from the motor specs this is or something? a this is a parameter if you remember from control systems the, the feedback loop for a control system here we have a gain km oh okay okay that's what it is
Okay, correct. What is the relation between torque and current? Torque is a constant Ki times the current itself. Again, in control systems, remember we had two block two blocks. One was the the electrical part. The other one was the mechanical part. The output or the electrical part was the current that was multiplied by again Ki becomes a torque that goes to the mechanical part. That's what this comes from. Okay. Okay. So let's say now we want to apply a torque of, uh, let's say T desired. What do we actually control in the motor? We control the current. So if you want to apply a torque desired, we can determine the current we need to apply as the desired torque divided by the torque constant. Oh, okay. This becomes the current desired, desired current. And this, so the torque is here, right? TD divided that by Ki becomes the desired current and that enters the loop and is compared with the actual current in the motor. Okay, so that's why you're multiplying by one over Ki because that's your, okay, yes. I see. I see, makes sense, thank you. Yeah. Or uh, no, another way to do this, a more expensive way to do this is to actually have a torque sensor here, a mechanical torque sensor. So then this disappears. If you have a mechanical torque sensor, it also goes away and the torque is injected directly there. Instead, in this sensor now calculates or measures the torque somehow, that is a possibility, mechanically, and then you compare the torques directly. Problem is that this sensors, torque sensors for um, a motor, uh, I think probably would cost around two to four thousand dollars. Whereas a current sensor uh, will probably cost less than a dollar to, to implement. Mm 